the word this morning. There's been many times that I've let you down Searching for happiness, but none to be found To think that the price you paid for me Wasn't in vain, all that agony But I'm here to say I've had my ups and my downs But I'm here now to stay Cause of the love that I found Now I'm giving my best To you, Lord All that I have I won't be Oh, I'm giving my best
to give him our best. He deserves our best. Yeah. In honor of uh, Mother's Day, I'm going to play this for that special mom that we all admire that brought our Savior into the world. Amen. the Lord. I just love that song. Hallelujah. So Mother's Day. Mother's Day. We're going to talk a little bit about that and we're just going to talk about the worth of Christian mothers and women in general. Sort of a little hodgepodge of different things we're going to share this morning. But again, I want to say happy Mother's Day to everyone. And and I always include women in, in uh, uh, general, in, yeah. gen in general and mothers because there are so many surrogate uh, mothers and people who have taken up the mantle and made huge differences in the lives of people and uh, they themselves don't have a natural child mm -hmm. so that's motherhood that's motherhood so let me just have a, a quick word of prayer and then we'll go into our lesson this morning father god again we just approach your throne of grace honoring you lord god as our king of kings and our lord of lords thank you lord god for this day that uh, has been established 
to celebrate and to honor uh, women and mothers in our lives, Lord God, because they carry so much on their shoulders and never complain, never complain, just continue to do and do and sacrifice and sacrifice. And so um, this day is, is, uh, is, is uh, proper. It's proper to honor uh, these women and mothers. So that's exactly what we've been doing. And that's exactly what we'll continue to do this morning. So, Father, we always give you all of the praise, honor, and the glory that is due your name. And um, we'll just ask your Holy Spirit to be with us this morning as we share. Amen and amen. 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 So our subject today is motherhood. And I uh, want to uh, look at how society views mothers and, and how the Bible views mothers and women. And so... Um, I want to just say well, question, where will we be without our moms? Well, we kind of know the general answer to that. But motherhood is one of the most important and fulfilling jobs in the universe. Amen. Yes. It's one of the most important jobs in the universe. Um, uh, women are and mothers are worth their weight in gold. They are worth their weight in gold. So uh, you can see from the pictures and the things on, uh, on here, all of the different positions that we pick up as mothers. And like I said earlier, we don't complain. We just do them. It just kind of comes natural. We don't, uh, uh, but uh, she is definitely worth her weight in gold. Uh, speaking of weight in gold, we want to, uh, Pastor Sam rather, <laughs> wants to, um, share with you about this weight in gold. So I'm gonna pull this up for him. So he can. Okay. All Amen. Right. Amen. The worth of the stay at home mom. And I'm gonna read some of the things that we have there. The worth of the stay-at-home mind, depending on the size of the family, pets, and numerous other conditions, the stay-at-home parent may work upwards of 98 hours a week. I think my mom, in general, worked even more than that with the conditions that we were working under. According to a 2019 data from salary.com, if you are a stay-at-home parent and paid for your service, you would be looking at a, a medium annual salary of $178,201. How many make that? How many moms make that much? I was a little short. Yes. <laughs> but that's what you are worth. And probably even more, If, like I said, again, if you grew up during the time period that my mom worked, she would work totally mm -hmm. uh, at home and then go out into the fields chop a big cotton or go fishing to feed the family and yeah. then come home and do all washing and cooking and cleaning. She was almost like a, at least um, sometime during the uh, harvest season, 20 hours a day working at that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the takeaway, a stay-at-home mom parent performed various jobs under, under the title of homemaker. According to the Pew Research, that's a good research, roughly one in five U.S. adults are stay-at-home parents. Now, normally it's the mom that basically stay at home. It should be, anyway. Stay-at-home parents often act as chauffeurs, chefs, nannies, tutors, and house cleaners. I know most of us can identify with that in that sense, with our mom. Uh, and they are kind of like a private chef. Now, everybody's cooking for their mom today. Mom's going to have a private chef. But mom make meal, meal preparation to one of the major tasks of most homemakers from breakfast to dinners. There's plenty of meal planning, especially now with the cost of living, just getting, uh, uh, going to the store and fighting the price of bringing the food home and that. You know. uh, and that would be at a cost of about $50 an hour. Yeah, that, that's what a chef probably would make, a good chef. 
if, the, if three meals, not including snacks, take someone three hours a day to prepare, that's easily $1,050 a week. Grocery shopping is another chore need to be factored in. A homemaker must drive to the supermarket, purchase the food, unpack it at home, and uh, let's say a grocery delivery service charges a fee of $20 and a homemaker shop twice a week, yeah, but he could $160 a month spent simply getting the grocery home, putting it in the refrigerator and the freezer and that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then come the house cleaning. A clean and tidy home is foundation of an effective household. Typical cleaning duties include vacuuming, dusting, sweeping, scrubbing, sink, washing dishes, making beds. Professional major house cleaning service provide often charges by the hour, the number of rooms or home square footage according to housekeeping.com. Cleaners make between 20 to $40 an hour on an average. Given these figures, an experienced cleaner like a stay-at-home parent, they ain't gonna put as much love as a stay-at-home parent, would make about $1,200 a week off $4,480 a month. Oh, that's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, if, if a stay-at-home parent would make an annual salary could run between $178,000 or more based on analysis from salary.com. And then child care, stay-at-home parents provide full-time living child care. This type of service from a professional provider usually comes with a host of perks, including health insurance, paid vacation, sick leave, et cetera, et cetera. These benefits, in addition to drawing a salary, according to the International Nanny Association, a living nanny earns an average of $20 an hour for a 40 week salary at home parent at, at that salary would make about $800 a week or $3,200 a month. Mm -hmm. A private car service might seem like a high end luxury to most, but the benefits of a stay at home parents get this service, do this service daily. Companies like Driver, Driver would provide Personal drivers that use the client's own car as a mean of transportation offers a glimpse in the cost of the homemaker's task. If you hire them, it'll cost between $25 and $32 an hour. If a stay-at-home parent will pay that salary, it'll make up to $1,380, six hours a day, seven days a week. Then come the laundry service. Oh, this is the thing my wife is a tick bill about. She just wash, wash, wash. Clean clothes come at a cost when you uh, pay for service like this. Homemakers do this free. Professional laundry service charged by the pound, according to the website, Easy Street Laundry Service, anywhere from $1 to $2 a pound. <laughs> <laughs> if a homemaker does a full pound laundry day, seven days a week, $2 a pound, they would earn $8 a day or $58 or $56 a week. If you count the sheets, comforters, and towels, often weigh more, you know, depending on what they got to wash. The bottom line, the daily work of a stay-at-home parent, a homemaker, can sometimes be taken for granted by other family members. I don't take what Yvonne does lightly at all. Honestly, the real work of the stay-at-home mom cannot be put into dollar amounts. Just Amen. cannot put that into a dollar amount, especially when you include the love and compassion that is thrown in there. Amen. Right. Now, I wonder how many uh, um, online, wait a minute, hold on. Okay. I wonder um, how many uh, online today uh, get uh, anywhere close to that amount for your services at home. Mm -hmm. Anybody? <laughs> we I think we probably know the answer to that but uh and you know somebody took the time to put all of that together and give us an idea of what 
the services of mothers is worth. Right. And when you think about it in dollar amounts, which she doesn't, uh, most moms don't sit down and get the family together and say, okay, where's my paycheck? You know, uh, that's love that does that. So that's why we appreciate moms and everything that they do. And we apologize for taking uh, advantage of them or taking them for granted. And uh, so that's why we give a shout out in a special way on Mother's Day. Thank you, Pastor Sam, for sharing that. Okay. One yeah. thing, y'all, uh, Pastor, Pastor Yvonne, y'all forgot, grandmother's babysitting. <laughs> What's the value of that, Sister George? You might as well go ahead and give us a value of uh, of that. What, what do you think you it should, should be? be $20 an hour. <laughs> 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 I think you are right. I think you are right. I think grandma should be paid even more then. Yes. Hint, hint. <laughs> okay. Um, so look at this little video about what housekeeping was back in the day. I'm not gonna play the whole thing. There were some fascinating things that housewives during the 1950s and 1960s did to fill their day while the kids were at school and their husband was away at work. These were the days of doing everything yourself and women were busy making the most of their time. They were the ultimate multitasker and they managed to do all of this while also raising a family. Keeping up with the societal expectations during the 1950s was a top priority for housewives. This meant spending hours on home decorating and housekeeping to make sure everything was in tip-top shape. From arranging flowers to folding laundry, housewives were masters of multitasking. Cooking was an art form in the 1950s and 1960s, and housewives would spend hours perfecting the recipes. They would create elaborate meals for dinner parties, learn to cook exotic dishes, and try out the latest food trends. Many of these recipes were stored together in a little recipe box that sat on top of the kitchen countertop. That box was treasured, and it may have even been passed down to you. New appliances like washing machines, dishwashers, and vacuum cleaners were revolutionizing household chores during the 1950s and 60s. Housewives were thrilled to have these tools at their disposal and use them to simplify their daily routines. With these time-saving appliances, they had more time for other hobbies and even crafts. When they weren't busy with household chores, housewives would take up hobbies such as knitting, sewing, and gardening. These activities were a great way to stay busy, express their creativity, and make something beautiful that they could then display around their house. Housewives also often participated in planned block parties, which were a great way to get to know your neighbors and build a sense of community. These events were a chance to get out of the house and socialize, play games, and enjoy each other's company. In the days before cable television, women would often listen to radio dramas and soap operas to stay entertained. They might also call in to quiz shows in the hopes of winning prizes. I remember them. <laughs> During the 1950s and 1960s, Tupperware was all the rage. Women would gather together at someone's house to see demonstrations of the latest Tupperware containers. These parties were not only a great way to sell products and make some extra money, but also a social event for women to catch up and have a good time. They would also create scrapbooks to preserve memories and document family history. They would use these books to store photos, letters, and other sentimental items that were important to them. 
These books were fun to flip through, especially when company came over. The 1950s and 1960s saw housewives often participating in women's clubs and neighborhood groups, such as the PTA and garden clubs. These groups were a way to meet new people, share their own ideas, and make a positive impact on their community. Saving money and getting a good deal meant clipping coupons from newspapers and magazines. Some housewives would spend plenty of time organizing these coupons so that they were ready to head to the grocery store with a plan. Housewives had to be creative with their budgets and make the most of every dollar. They would find ways to stretch their budgets, such as buying in bulk and making their own cleaning products. They were also experts at meal planning and finding ways to feed their families nutritious meals on a tight budget. Okay, I'm gonna stop that one right there. I got another one, real short one. Uh, but look at the way these people dress at home and uh, the way, they, you know, that that is amazing and that's true that's true everybody had an apron uh everybody you know every i mean you treated your home in the way that you uh lived in your home the same way you would go out in society and and uh, we've kind of gotten away from that we, well we have gotten away from that a lot um some of the uh scenes that they showed in here uh, where a mom is uh, taking care of the house and cleaning and vacuuming and doing all that, the the way that she's attired look better than what some people show up at church in, you know. In so things have really changed. I want to show this other one a little short. One. Oops. Housekeeping still remains the most important business of the world. It engages the hearts and minds of more people and calls for higher qualities than any other occupation. Each woman faces it single-handed. She must know how to cook, no food. She must know how to set her table attractively. She must know how to make her home comfortable and inviting. She must know the worth of labor-saving devices and how best to conserve her time and energy. She must know clothes, how to buy, and how to make them. She must face death to bring children into the world. She must raise them, care for them, and pilot them safely to the threshold of manhood and womanhood. To her husband, she must be a companion, a sweetheart, a wife, and a mother. She must stir his ambition, pull him through fear, and keep success from hurting him. She must make social contact. She must widen her own horizon and find time for culture. Housekeeping still remains the most. Okay. All right. So uh, that's gone, by the way, of the dinosaur. Those uh, th those two videos. But you know what? Things were a lot better back in those days. They were. They were a whole lot better. Um, Proverbs, you know, we have Proverbs 31, which is our favorite woman a proverb. And, and it says, I have three verses, up, uh, well, several verses up here. Proverbs 31.25 says, strength and honor are her clothing. She is confident about the future. So uh, 20, 
in, uh, through 21 says she reaches out to the needy. She stretches out her hands to the poor. She doesn't fear for her household when it snows because they are all dressed in warm clothes. So she takes care of her uh, children and her husband and whoever else is in her household to make sure that they're taken care of most of the time, even before she's taken care of. I know my mom did. You know, she was always patching clothes, and I don't think people do that anymore. You get a little uh, nip in your um, your your socks or your clothes or your blouse or shirt, and they would put those patches on there or mend them. You don't even see people. I, does anybody have a needle anymore? You don't see people sewing anymore. Uh, everybody was into crafts. I remember uh, Joyce's mom, Miss Azola, was always sewing. Every time I would go to her house, she'd be downstairs on that sewing machine making dresses and uh, for all the girls. And, you know, those are memories. And those are things that kept that family real close together. You know, we've gotten away from that and we can see the results. Uh, 3130 says, charm is deceptive and beauty fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So that comes first because everything else is vanity. You know, if you put it, if you're putting your whole uh, thinking and worth into the outside, like Sharina said this morning um, about being a hypocrite, you know, and you let your heart and your relationship with God suffer because your whole purpose is putting things on the outside for other people to see, you know, well, you're fooling yourself. And that's called being a hypocrite. Okay? Women of God can never be women of the world. The world has enough women who are tough. We need more women who are tender. There's enough women who are coarse. We need women who are kind. There are enough women who are rude. But we need women who are refined. There are enough women of fame and fortune. But we need women of faith. We have enough greed. We need more goodness. We need more virtue. We have enough popularity. We need more purity. So that's a reflection of the opposite of the world, a worldly woman and a woman of God. Motherhood is one of the one of humanity's oldest, most respected and essential human institutions. As moms infuse and shape their children's emotion, their physical and spiritual well-being. Fortunately, there are numerous mothers in, in the Bible whose incredible reactions, decisions, and overall life trajectories provide important and timeless lessons for humanity. They change the course of the world by their decisions regarding their children. I wanna take a, a look at a couple of them, uh, women in the Bible. Um, Jochebed, uh, we know her to be the mother of Moses, and she sacrificed her son. And uh, it was certainly a divine appointment. In Exodus 1, 17 through 19, it says, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. Of course, we know that um, they were to kill all of the, uh, the Jewish boys and girls, um, and they didn't want them to live. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, this is when they were in captivity, and said to them, why have you done this thing and saved the male children? So the midwives kind of got together and did not do what the king had ordered. They, the king wanted uh, them to make sure that none of the Jewish uh, boys lived. And so they were, when the 
uh, Jewish mothers would give birth, then they were to make sure that that baby did not live, but they defied the king's, uh, the, uh, king's order and they let the babies live. So he approached them and he says, why have you done this? And saved the male children. In 19, and the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. In other words, they're saying they're too fast for us. Before we even get to them, they've already had a kid. Okay. So thank God for the Egyptian midwives that didn't follow through with what Pharaoh, uh, King Pharaoh had said. And then in nine, it says, then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take uh, her maid, take this child away and nurse him for me. And I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. This is Moses, of course. And the child grew. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. So she called his name. Moses saying, because I drew him out of the water. That's what the name Moses means, to be drawn, to be drawn out of the water. So Moses was saved um, by these women, by uh, his birth mother, who uh, knew that she had to give him away. And she sacrificed him and sent him down the river. And he was uh, uh, picked up by the uh, by Pharaoh's daughter, and then uh, along with the nurses, they saved him, rescued him, and he began to develop. And we know the rest of the story. He became king of Egypt, um, prince of Egypt. Okay, so that was uh, uh, Jacobet, and then Mary. Mary, we know her to be blessed among. All women, that's what the Bible says, blessed among all. Mary is without a doubt the most well-known and reverent, uh, revered woman in the Bible. And the scriptures explain that God chose Mary to be Jesus's mother. She was chosen, okay? Granting her one of the most important and transformational roles in human history. And we know the confusion that caused we also know that the angels came to both Mary and Joseph and explained the whole thing. You guys haven't done anything wrong. This is God's plan. God has chosen you. So in Luke uh, 1, the story, but when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and consider what manner of greeting this is. Talking about the angels. In 30, then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Man, you know, I love that verse, to be, to be found favor or to be given favor by God is something really special. That should be our prayer. That's what I pray every day. Lord, give me favor. Give my family favor. Give my friends favor. Give my church favor. You know, in other words, that means be a big old fat blessing every day on each one of us, okay? In 31, and behold, the angel said, you will conceive in your womb. I put that in red, and I'll explain it. He said, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. They didn't have to think about anything. Even the name was picked out. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, the earthly throne. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom and uh, end of his kingdom. There will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? She was a little behind. She still didn't get it. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit, Mary, will come upon you, Mary, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. This is how this whole thing is going to happen. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. 
Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, your cousin, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For God, for with God, nothing will be impossible. So we know the story of John the Baptist and Jesus, and they were like six months apart. And said, but let me go back to this. Um, the angel told Mary that she would conceive in your womb. Um, you have to scratch your head right there because we don't conceive our children in our womb. It's not where the baby is conceived. So right there, it's supernatural, right? Okay. This was a supernatural event. The pregnancy starts with fertilization. And when a woman's egg joins with a man's sperm, fertilization usually takes place in the fallopian tube that links an ovary to the uterus. If the fertilized egg successfully travels down the fallopian tube and implants in the uterus, an embryo starts growing. And right there, you have a baby. And I try to put some little pictures to kind of illustrate where all of these things are. And most of us have been in, in our health classes and all kind of books and things through the years. So we kind of know this, but some people just kind of go right over that part where, where you will conceive in the womb. That's where the baby grows. The baby was already conceived before it got there. So that's interesting to me. So the baby is not a clump of cells, is non-viable, scratch that, body parts. He's a human child from the get-go. He's a human child. Um, my next example and my last example is Naomi. She's the exemplary or mother-in-law. A lot of people don't like their mother-in-laws, but, but uh, Naomi was a good one. Naomi was a good one. Naomi is perhaps the Bible's most famous mother-in-law in her stunning qualities of kindness and care for others and sacrifice shouldn't be lost, okay? So I got a little video for her, a couple of minutes. Naomi journeyed with her husband and two sons to Moab during a time of famine in Israel. After her husband died, Naomi continued to raise her sons and was delighted when they married Moabite women. Sadly, both sons died at a very early age. Naomi's daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, became widows like her. The Book of Ruth is the story of the heroic Moabite woman who accompanied her mother-in-law back to Israel and claimed the Jewish people as her own. Naomi, like her daughter-in-law Ruth, is an admirable character in the story. Even amid the sadness and difficulty that followed the deaths of her sons, Naomi was primarily concerned about her daughters-in-law. She encouraged them to return to their own people and find husbands and homes there. When Ruth insisted on going with her mother-in-law back to Israel, Naomi was eager for Ruth to find a new husband. She was confident that God would watch over both of them. Soon after their arrival, Ruth began gathering remnants left behind by those harvesting the wheat fields. Ruth happened to choose a field owned by Boaz, a cousin of Naomi. When Boaz showed special kindness to Ruth, Naomi recognized God's hand at work. And Naomi was not bashful about helping God's plan along. When the time was right, Naomi encouraged Ruth to return to Boaz at night when he was sleeping in his barn and to sleep near him. This would be a clear signal that Ruth wanted Boaz to ask her to marry. Boaz understood the message and he and Ruth were married. They had a son named Obed who became the grandfather of King David. We remember Naomi for her strong faith and determination. 
She recognized and celebrated God's faithfulness to her people and her family, and she remained faithful to God in return. Okay, it's Naomi. It was a strong woman with strong uh, daughter-in-laws that stood by her. They refused to go back to Ruth, refused to go back to her own people, but decided to stay with her. So that's love. Amen. So I want to, uh, as we finish up, I want to give you what I put together as uh, I call them uh, woman nuggets and uh, just some things I want hopefully will stay with you uh, as a woman, as a woman of God um, in a world that is very challenging to all of us uh, every day. It, it kind of gets worse and we're going to be challenged even more. So hopefully these nuggets will help, you know, to kind of bring everything that we've talked about today um, together. So uh, the first one is a godly woman possesses a keen sense of discernment. And for that, I use Proverbs 15, 14. It says the discerning heart seeks knowledge. So we're always, as women, we're always wanting to know more about God, seeking knowledge, wanting to make sure we do things right. A good Christian mother stays intimately connected with God so that she will keep a discerning heart. She's willing to grow in knowledge through the reading of God's word and absorbing truth from mature, godly mothers. God grants her discernment in the lives of her children so that they may be uh, specifically well trained in righteousness. So she seeks and she possesses uh, discernment from God. And that discernment is what leads her to do the proper things. A godly woman forgives the offenses of others willingly. That's paramount. John 20, verse 23, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. So it's up to you. When someone offends you, the first thing you should do as a godly woman, I always say, no matter who started it, because we always go back to that. Well, I didn't do it. They did it to me for, you know. Forget about that. That's, that's not important. The important is to get it right with God and to get it right with the other person. So if you forgive, you're supposed to forgive their sin. Their sins will be forgiven. Offenses will come from within and without of the home. Okay? Yet the godly mother won't hold for, uh, forgiveness hostage until she feels better. Some people do that. They use it as a tool to manipulate the person who did something to them, like a tool to, you know, like holding them hostage and always brings it up. Well, and that's not forgiveness. If you're always bringing it up after every new argument or situation, you haven't forgiven them. You haven't forgiven, simple as that. Uh, rather, she chooses to forgive immediately and trust the Holy Spirit to heal her her hope, her hurts. I'm sorry. Her family recognizes this principle in her and practices forgiving others as a way of life. So she's an example. She sets the pattern, okay, around the house. The kids see her quickly forgiving the, the dad or the neighbor or the whoever. And they go, oh, man, mom, wow, she didn't even get mad at them or this and that. So you set the pattern. Um, a godly woman persists in prayer all the time. According to Luke 18.1, they should always pray and not give up. You can't give up. You can't have doubt. You can't operate in faith and doubt at the same time. Doubt negates faith. A believing mom never gives up on her children, especially her prodigals. Anybody got any of those? People will write off a difficult, rebellious child, but not a praying mother. Nope. 
She will plead the grace and mercy of God over their lives as long as there's breath in her body. This mother is compelled and encouraged by the Holy Spirit to, uh, to keeping praying, to keep praying no matter what. I think I meant to say, to keep praying no matter what. A godly woman exhibits steadfastness in the word of God. Psalm 11, uh, 111.10 says, all who follow his precepts have good understanding. Follow, not just read, but read and then follow. Read and then say, okay, I've been doing this all wrong. I got to follow, I got to do it this way because this is God's way. She meditates on the Holy Scriptures regularly. The Christian mother uh, actively engages the word of God for every problem in the home. She doesn't make a step until she finds the ad adequate scripture or verse addressing her situation. And she uses that as her um, starting point as her foundation for this situation. And she stays on it steadfastly. She meditates on the Holy, Holy Scripture regularly, as well as speaking and teaching them to her children. Her family witnesses her diligence and learns from her example to apply God's teachings to their everyday life. And like I say all the time, being an example sometimes is even more, well, I believe it's more important than even sitting down and having them read. Be that example or read it to them and then show them how it's done in action. Put it into action. Don't have them read something and then uh, they see you arguing with someone on the telephone or getting loud or getting, you know, irate. Well, they're going to think you are a hypocrite. She just told me not to do it. Why'd she tell me not to do it and she's doing it? That ain't right. These kids know that these kids are smart. They observe everything that you do and they're evaluating. Maybe sometimes they're too young to express how they feel because they might think they're getting ready, they're gonna get a pop, <laughs> you know, for challenging you. But eventually, they will live it out, or they will address it when they think that they are, you know, mature enough to. So don't think that because your children are small that you know you can get away with anything and. They're not going to say anything. They might not say anything right now, but they are evaluating. They're kind of putting things together. And they might not know to call you a hypocrite, but in their mind, that's what they're thinking. A godly woman brings order to chaos. Proverbs 31, 27 she watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She ain't got time. She ain't got time to just be a busybody in somebody else's business. And you got plenty of things to get done in your own life, in your own family. A Christian mother is marked for her diligence and resistance, resistance to laziness and slothfulness. Her chief concern isn't the, the uh, perfect home, but rather a healthy home full of love, laughter, and order. I don't know if any of you came from a house where there was complete chaos all the time, but that has to be so uncomfortable. I have been very privileged to have lived with my two parents and my brother who was an invalid all of his life. He was always in a wheelchair. There was always fun in our life. My mom, we, I didn't know we were poor until we got older. Cause they didn't walk around talking about how poor we are and what we don't have. 
we thought we were the richest kids in the neighborhood. We had food. We had, you know, like as if my mom would fix up my clothes and get me a new couple of new dresses for school to start. And I'd lay them out and mix them up. Two dresses, two pair of socks and two under underwear. And so, you know, I thought I was the richest person on the face of the earth. My brother did too. Not knowing behind the scenes when you get old, what they had to do to get those few things. But they didn't complain. Man, I had to scrape, I had to borrow, I had to do this just to get you some school clothes and just to do this. You, we never heard that. It was always there. But later, you found out. Later, when you got older, you found out. And then that just made you appreciate them even more. She keeps her home free from uh, only free, not only from physical clutter, but watches for the spiritual and emotional clutter of the world. Certain things that shouldn't be available for the eyes of children. So when my mom and dad would have their, and now we know what they were doing, they had a little argument, they would go in the other room. Me and my brother tried to listen, but we couldn't hear him. Certain things are not for the ears and the eyes of your children. It affects them. They shouldn't hear about all of your bills and all we got to do this, and I don't know how we're going to make it. Those things should be done in private between the husband and the wife. They should just, the kids should just be feeling love, 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 no matter what's going on. To them, it's just pure love going on. But you're in the background making it happen. You and God and your hubby. A godly woman is willing to release her children to God. Romans 5, 5, hope does not, uh, hope does not disappoint. While the Christian mother holds her children tightly around her heart, she releases them to grow in Christ at their own pace. She's entrusted her prayers to God to protect and to lead them in the direction of his will. Her influence and persuasion centers around the Lord's will more than her personal preference for their future. There's no such thing as a perfect mother. And I know some of y'all are disappointed. But the Christian mother continues to be perfected by the grace of God. She is invaluable to the kingdom of Christ due to her influence on the next generation. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, every godly mother is flavor, a flavorful blessing to her children and children's children. So I guess we can say that with each generation is a reflection of the uh, generation that they were under, right? So every generation, you can, you, like, we can, we can for sure say that the generation that we were under is responsible for our actions because they raised us. They gave us the good and the bad examples. They let us get away with things or they didn't let us get away with things. They made sure that we knew the word of God, even though sometime when we got older, we turn away for, for a while, but the Bible says that. The Bible says that sometimes the children might walk away from the word. The prodigal son, remember? But then that word says in, in, what is that, Luke 19? And when he had come to his senses, I love that. That prodigal son, in other words, he remembered all of those things that were told to him when he was younger. And he came back to his senses and then he came home where there was food and stuff like that because he was out there eating with the pigs. 
but you let them go. You raise them right, and you have nothing to ha hang your head down for at all. You know, you raised them right, you taught them right, and then the rest, you put them into God's hand, and you continue to pray. You will pray for them until you take your last breath. That's just motherhood. So I think that was my last one. Yeah. Motherhood is not easy. And I know that uh, I can get some amens on that. It's challenging, but like I started off, it is the, the most worthwhile institution that God formed. Uh, for a mother and how he created it and how he chose to do it with the husband and the wife and the family and repopulating the world and teaching your family to do the Lord's business. That's how it's supposed to be done through your family line, making the world better. But if you never take the time to teach them what they're supposed to be doing in the world and to not conform to the world, they won't know what to do. And that's what we have now in a lot of cases, a bunch of young folks who are trying to figure it out for themselves because they raised themselves. They didn't have good examples. And so they're getting their examples from television, from the movies, the internet now. We didn't have the internet, thank God, we didn't have the internet when I was growing up, barely had a TV, it was six inches. So praise the Lord, hallelujah. Uh, we're gonna pray for everyone. And then if you have any questions about 